Okay, um, of course, first thing first, I'm David Dominguez. I work in UX in RBS, in the Royal Bank of Scotland, actually. And uh, I've been there one year, well, it's going to be one year on the 5th of January. And uh, they brought me there to help kind of like grow an agency within the bank, actually. We are not working with a kind of like day-to-day you know, banking that is for, you know, the Joe in the street, like me, my mobile banking, or my kind of like day-to-day -day banking. We are kind of like, in this case, kind of like helping out to revamp bam banking for um, big corporations, uh, big companies, you know, not the kind of like uh, one of one person banking, actually. Okay, so um, let's go to the talk. A few months back, I was asked, you know, by the mobile UX guys, actually, to, to kind of like come over, talk a little bit, and they were suggesting me about banking, of course, talking about banking, talking a bit about, about e-commerce, because, you know, the previous company that I was working in was an e-commerce company, actually, was eBay. But, um, you know, since, you know, all of my life, and since I was a kid, actually, I've been exposed you know, many times, and probably you have been exposed so many times, like now, actually, with the tortoise and the hare story, actually, to Aesop's kind of like stories, Aesop's fables. And I think that is a good frame for us today to talk about uh, some, let's say, guidelines, or kind of like, I prefer to call it notes, because it's like I'm feeling that I'm, that I'm preaching the choir here, because I saw that there is a lot of you extras in the room already. So, um, you know, just to kind of like give my, my kind of like two drops in the ocean, you know, about UX design. So, um, no author in Greek history has been more read, more translated, more adapted, embellished, printed, illustrated than Aesop. So, who was he? And I will, I will read actually. Uh, to you what another Greek historian says about him. The great benefactor of mankind. He was a turnip with teeth, pot-bellied, misshapen of head, snub-nosed, dwarfish, bandy-legged, short-armed, squint-eyed, level-lipped, in short a portentous monstrosity of a person. However, he rose to prominence in history by recording popular knowledge in the form of fables. So probably you have many of those, you know, across in your life as you came across. The thing is, did he even exist? And uh, probably not. He didn't, he didn't exist. The chronicle of his life is actually a Greek romance or maybe a legend, sorry, or even a fable. So, why Aesop? So, according to Herodotus, I don't know how you pronounce it properly, you know, just pronouncing Aesop for me was a bit of a difficult thing, you know, because being Spanish, you would say Aesop. Nevertheless, Aesop was a slave. He started his life not even speaking. He won his freedom through telling fables. He rose to prominence. He was, he was living with uh, philosophers. Well, living. He was with philosophers. He served kings. So he went from really low to really high in society, actually. However, he was falsely, falsely framed, tried, convicted, and executed for theft and blasphemy at Delphi, which actually, by the way, it was a total lie. They just wanted to frame him because they were so jealous about him, from him, actually. So he tried to talk his way out as he could have done many times before and have done many times before, but that, that time it didn't work out. So they throw him down the cliff and they kill him. So I think his figure has some characteristics that resonate with 
user experience designers, with UXers. So what are those key characteristics? And I, and I would like to highlight them to you. First off, he perceives the world that is around him. He is a great observer. So he takes note of what is happening around him, the people that is around him, the human nature, the drivers, the interests that move people, and uses that to explain the world as well. So one thing is the world that is around us, another thing is the world as we see it, and another thing is the world as somebody tells you about. Next one. Aesop always has the right story for the difficult situations he is in. I'm not going to go and dwell in how many times he was in trials, he was almost killed a few times, you know, he was always framed, because he fully understands the context, actually, and has, and has an extensive well of fables to resort to. So not only he observes the world, he also has all of that knowledge that he can resort to when he needs to. So when times comes, his masters, the philosopher, the king, come and ask him, okay, can you help us out with this? Him that was a slave. Well, at the end of the day, he got free. So what else? He is a problem solver. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about a small story, actually, about Aesop. So before he, he could even speak, he was framed by his two, let's say, colleagues, you know, other two, other two um, slaves that he was serving with to his master. And he couldn't speak. And obviously, you know, there was something going on there. They didn't like him, so they said, actually, there was this sack of figs, and somebody ate those figs. They framed him, actually. So he couldn't speak. So he was in a bit of a kind of like issue over here. So he resorted to solve this problem by just basically, and I'm just going to say it here, he just vomited and puked what he had in his stomach just to prove his master that he didn't have any figs. He, he couldn't eat them if he didn't have any in his stomach. But he made the other two guys, actually, the other two slaves, kind of like puke up. Have a guess where the figs were, actually, in their stomachs. So he's solving an issue there. He's solving his problems. As well as that, I think he is a great reframer. He takes those human stories and puts them into a different frame. For example, takes objects and humanizes them. Takes animals and makes them human, gives them human characteristics. So takes that story or that what happened and puts it into a different setting to illustrate his point, of course. And the last one, you know, right here, I think he is a great storyteller. And why do I think he's a great storyteller? It's because everyone copied his stories, you know, his fables. You know, and he can get away, actually, many times, not the last time, of course, when he gets killed. You know, he gets away through stories, actually. So he has been present you know, they, in our day-to-day -day lives, and probably you heard of stuff from him that you didn't know it was from him, actually, for the last two, well, you didn't live two and, a half, two and a half thousand years, but he has been there for two and a half thousand years. Okay, so as I said before, you know, I know that I'm preaching the choir today, you know, but I would like to ask you, kind of like, you know, just bring your hands up if you feel that what I just said resonates with you, actually. I think it does resonate with me. Okay, so for us as designers, you know, as Aesop, we observe the users and the world and the context they are in. We draw on our past experiences and also things we see around us and moments of life, actually, to solve problems, to initiate, to help with the design process. You know, I think this is a no-brainer, of course. We are problem solvers, you know? And most of the times, a problem is exactly what makes us start working. So 
we have to go and solve an issue. An issue that comes from a user, or maybe from a product owner, or maybe from who knows. One of the key qualities of a good designer, which you know, I totally resonate with, is reframing. We many times have to take things out of context, twist them a little bit, you know, evolve them, and then kind of like bring them back and reapply them in our design. So I think that is a really key capability that designers have. And of course, we are storytellers. Even though we don't tell our stories like what I'm telling you today, we don't go and speak to the user, hello, this is how things are. Our products, our services, unravel like stories. You know, our users are living our stories, the stories that we put together. And like in Aesop, they are the protagonists. So with what I just said, and you know, I've, I saw a few hands raising up, you know, I think you know, I am entitled to say that you know, I'm going to take some of his stories, some of his fables, and apply them to the user experience, mobile design process. Yeah? I must say, there are 300 different fables recorded from, from, well, in the name of Aesop, actually. Most of them, as I said, he did not create. Most of them were, recopi were recopulated, I think is the right word, were just basically taken and put together you know, by, by, by scholars. And what he said is that, you know, once he was traveling, because he was a well-traveled person, actually. He was observing the world and he was going alone. Okay, so out of all of those fables, actually, we are going to look at four. Uh, I've taken these uh, fables and adapted them slightly because, you know, the version of the, of the life, of, life of Aesop that I took is from 1687. So there were some anachronisms in the English, of course, you know, in the, in the language. So, you know, I cut a little bit, you know, and like everybody else did, you know, I'm just adapting them a little bit to suit my interest. So um, the illustrations that you're going to look at are part of this book, and uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is a well-renowned uh, illustrator, Francis Barlow, who made this edition. Okay, so one thing, this is public domain, so you can go and take it anytime. So I'm not just infringing any copyright issues here. Just letting you know, of course. Okay, so the first one. The donkey eating thistles. I hope I pronounce it right. So a donkey loaded with food and provisions is on the way to, to bring all of this food to his master and his friends because they're going to have a feast. As he goes on the way, he stops in the road, and on the side, he, he sees a thistle, quite a big one, actually, and starts munching on it. OK, I'm just going to go and have this thistle. You know? While he was munching, this donkey starts thinking and reflects and says, how many greedy epicures would think themselves happy with such a variety of delicacies as I know curry. But to me, this bitter, this bitter prickle thistle is more savory and relishing than the most exquisite banquet. OK, so the donkey is carrying all of this really nice stuff. I can see there's some wine, maybe game, you know, some chicken. But he's quite happy with the thistle. I'm, I'm not by, by any way. Sorry, by no means I'm saying that, you know, poor donkey. No, what I'm just saying is he likes the thistles. He doesn't like the other stuff. So the first thing that I would like to extract from here is, you know, not all of the features might be right for your mobile approach. It may, it may be that unique feature or differentiator that is what you need. So it's not always about the bells and whistles. It's not always about having um, all of those features in there. How do you know what is right and what is not right? Obviously, go back and understand your users, observe your world, 
observe their context, and draw knowledge out of it. Okay, I'll give you a couple of examples. So this is product people trying to work out the users. And uh, this was a series of workshops that uh, we did back uh, when I was in eBay, actually. And uh, so they are going through those different types of users, you know, and there are three key things that they are, they are trying to find out, which is, of course, the goals, which is the ultimate want of the user, the triggers, which is what makes your user go and open your application, go to your website, ring your help desk, and the pain points, of course, those problems, those issues, what they encounter, what makes them like, what the heck is this? You know, the other part that I was talking about was the user journey. So we understand the users, but we need to understand, we also need to understand, you know, their context. We've got here an example of, you know, a multi, let's say, multi-border, multi-language, kind of like, let's say, map out of the user experience for sellers and, uh, and for buyers. As you can see, I mean, it's not very clear in there, but you've got two, clearly two, sorry, two key streams. The red at the top and the blue at the bottom. The buyers at the top and the sellers at the bottom. They go through the same process, but they've got different needs across. So they have different views, they have different pain points, etc., etc. That is what is going to help us get into that point, to that specific, let's say, to that good feature or that good group of features that you need to put together. Okay, let's go to the next one. The old man and his sons. So the story goes as this. Uh, a farmer had three or four sons, actually, you know, three sons in the, in the, in the story. So they were always fighting. So one day, he just said, okay, bring me, uh, what was the word, uh, a bundle of sticks. So he took the sticks, he, he bundled them together, gave them to each of the songs, you know, the stick to break it, the bundle to break it. They couldn't break it, of course, you know, there were a lot of sticks in there. So then what he did is unpack that bundle and give them, each one of them, a stick to break, and they could break it. Okay, so, so, you also, my sons, if you unite in mind, like that, that bunch, actually, you will present yourselves to your enemies as invincible. I'm not calling our users, in, uh, sorry, I'm not calling our users uh, enemies, you know, but it's a frame. Because mobile is not just one unique, let's say, approach, and that is the approach. Mobile lives within other, let's say, other touch points. So it is very strange that you've got only, let's say, a, that application or that service that is only relying on the mobile phone. You know, you may have the call center where your clients ring to solve issues. You may have a brick and mortar shop where your clients come to better know your products and try them up. You may have a branch where you get your clients coming in and they talk to you about their mortgage. You may have a computer screen of course, you know, where you can access your website. Or, of course, you can have a mobile device where your user is always carrying, that your user is always carrying, you know, and it's always accessible. Okay, so don't think as mobile just as, you know, the only thing in there. Another example, you know, this is an e-commerce kind of like map out that we did in eBay. In fact, I didn't do it. It was Aileen Beck. I'm not sure if she's here today. And what, what they did is just going and looking at users and try to understand, you know, how users go through the funnel of discovering a product and buying the product. As you can see in there, we've got many, many devices in there. And, you know, users go through a process. First off, they go through incubation process in which any device should do, you know, to go and look at, ah, okay, I've got this product I want to buy. I want to buy these slippers or whatever. So they can look in the mobile, they can look in the, in the, in the, um, in the laptop, in the tablet, etc. actually. Then, once all of that selection is done, is the, the part of kind of like, okay, 
I've got 200, I need to narrow it down to 20, because it's too much to take on. That generally is, is taken in bigger screens. And then once you've got your selection, sorry, you're kind of like, once you kind of like peel that, that up, you know, you go and select, which is generally, you know, once again in any screen, but if you've got a no-brainer product that you really, really want, you know, you're gonna go and do it with your mobile phone. What I'm trying to get to in here is, you know, as I said before, illustrate to you that, you know, mobile is not just, you know, the only thing to have in mind in there. Okay, I'm gonna quickly jump into the, four, into the third story, actually. The jackdaw and the peacocks. The story goes as this. Uh, a jackdaw, which is a type of bird, I don't know exactly how it looks like, you know, but I think it's a bit ugly. Well, if you compare it with, with obviously, with a peacock, you know. Uh, so he was kind of like going around close to some peacocks and he saw some of those feathers and he said, ah, I'm going to take those feathers. I'm just going to put them myself. So he tried to kind of like, you know, make, make himself, let's say, beautiful as a peacock. So once he said, okay, I'm looking at the mirror, I look all right. Okay, so I'm going to go with the peacocks, you know. That's where I should be, not with the, not with the jock dogs, come on. So when he goes and stays with the peacocks and the peacocks is that kind of like taking his feathers out. It's like, hey, come on. You know, why, why do you have this? This is a deception, you know? So they stripped this foolish guy out of his colors. Okay. Outer beauty is pleasing, if inner beauty is present, of course. The fact is that if outer or inner beauty has to be lacking, it is better that you lack outer beauty rather than inner beauty. Okay, so reverberating again from previous story that I just told you, you know, as with the Jack, sorry, Jack Doe story, your mobile approach should cater for the core needs of your users in their context. So, you know, you better kind of like get right that specific or differentiator, that, that specific thing or differentiator that you've got from your product or, or service, you know, put it in your handheld device, or that specific part in your flow where the mobile phone is best suited for. Maybe if you have resources down the line, you may want to go and add all of the other stuff in your handheld device. To give you an example, right now, uh, we are in the middle of a kind of like big overhaul of a service. It is a banking service, actually, in, in RBS that has been out there for 16 years. It has been there, you know, for web, it, used to, it uses Java, you know, it's a nightmare for, for our users, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what we're trying to do is redefine this space, actually, this application. And we are not looking at it just as, you know, the website. As you can see, we've got different types of users, like the clerk, the manager, and the client. And I, and I have to say client in there because, you know, what we do is provide banking services to other companies that provide banking services to, his, to their clients. So we've got this kind of like clerk in there, which is going to be using the, the computer most of the time, actually, because it's a nine to five job. It's going to be sitting at her desk, you know, and that's going to be mainly what she's doing. We've got the client, which is going to be trying to make sure that, you know, his money is managed well, for whom, you know, a big screen, kind of like sitting at the comfy of your sofa, you know, makes sense because it's, I want to go and see my finances. I don't need to go and dig in them. I want to see that I am in the clear. I'm not in the red, of course. And then we've got the manager, who is the person that, you know, is more prone to have the device. Because really what is happening here is the clerk creates payments. The manager authorizes the payments. And instead of having, well, I, I didn't bring with me one of these card readers that are quite, you know, cumbersome, which is 16 years old, like I told you. You know, it's kind of like a big thing. You know, you put your card, you, you punch your codes, you know, it's like, my God, if I go away on holidays, because this happens a lot, if I go away on holidays, what am I going to do? I have to bring with me this little, this little card reader, you know, and that's going to be annoying. Okay, why don't we just take your mobile phone with you because you will always have it in your pocket, you know, and we enable you to authorize your payments in your mobile phone. So that is the example that I'm just trying to bring in here. Quickly, going to the next one, 
the dog and the wolf. And this one, I must say, that is, it was the, let's say, the most difficult to kind of like twist into what I wanted. And I'll tell you why. Well, you will notice. So, skinny wolf walking down the road, or the street, or the, or the, or the forest, actually, encounters a dog. Kind of like one of these uh, hounds, dog, hound dogs, actually. And, you know, the hound dog notices that the wolf is quite skinny, he's almost dying, he didn't eat for like three days, and he says, look, cousin, why don't you come with me? You know, I've got this master, he gives me food, he kind of like takes care of me, I have water, I have a shelter, I have my kind of like house over there, you know, and, you know, we can share the food, and we can also share the kind of like the burden, kind of like helping him out, etc., etc. Okay, the wolf says, yeah, that sounds all right, let's go over there. So on the way, actually, the wolf notices that, um, that the dog has some marks in his neck. And, uh, you know, he realizes, hey, what's going on with this? You know, you are serving your master. And, and then, actually, the, the, the wolf says, goodbye to you, master dog. Better start free than be a fat slave. Okay, so let's go into framing this, actually, properly. Okay, so if you leave your mobile design to the end, like, you know, the wolf, almost the wolf does, you know, by just getting to the house of the master and realizing when he arrives there, oh, uh, Shaisa, I'm, I'm going to be a slave here, you know. But if you realize before, it's when you can just basically say, okay, I'll take my decisions. What I'm, gonna, what I'm, what I'm going to do with this, actually, don't leave, obviously, your design, your mobile design approach to the end and risk fragmentation. I show this photo over here because you've got one, two, three different plates from different places, and you've got a knife that is from one father, you know, a spoon from another father, and a, and a fork from another mother, actually. So it's like, you know, in this product you saw before, you've got a service in which you've got a mobile phone that looks, sorry, a mobile phone app that looks one way, a mobile phone web that looks another way, the actual, um, the actual website looks in a different way. The data doesn't really make sense. You know, the experience breaks. The information architecture is, is not the same. You know, why do I bring this, actually? Because, you know, when I jumped at this, at this project that I was telling you, you know, this, this complete overhaul that is going to take us two years, actually, to do, they were telling me, OK, let's not go in, into mobile, OK? Let's not think about it. Let's go first into web and a little bit on, on tablet. The thing is, you know, we have, to, we have to kind of like rebel, if you call it this way, you know. And the thing is, even without the stakeholder kind of like putting too much emphasis on that, you know, we felt that we had to put emphasis on mobile. We need to make it core. Because actually, as I said, in a period of two years, our type of customers are going to be different, because I didn't tell you. So first we are tackling these kind of like big companies, but then we are going to go and tackle with the same service smaller companies, private, private, uh, well, wealthy people actually, and you know those needs are going to change down the line. So what we are doing is setting up a foundation. I'm not saying that the, the mobile the mobile approach is the best. It's all worked out. It's just a foundation that we can review. I'm just finishing now. OK, to recap, that's it. Perfect. OK, understand your uses and context. Of course, observe them. You know, get to understand their needs, get their context. Mobile is part of a bigger story, of course. You know, it's not just mobile. It's a lot of things that are kind of like forming part of your, of your service. Uh, it is about the right tasks. Make sure your mobile approach is relevant, you know, in the point where it needs to be relevant. And uh, of course, don't leave the, the mobile design to the end, you know, because I don't want us to get lost on, well, we've got so many things, mobile is one of them. It's still at the core, actually, of your design. So, you know, what I just told you here, actually, were some fables that I just tried to push into my advantage, you know. You can make a different read out, out of these fables, you know, or maybe take different fables if you want to, you know, to tell your story. You know, what I just did is the same as, you know, Aesop. I just took some of those fables and framed them to fit my own message, just like what he does. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>